Now we shift uh, significantly. Uh, Jonathan Crane, Dr. Crane is uh, a specialist in tropical and subtropical fruit crops. He's got more than 30 years of experience with production systems for these kinds of crops. Uh, he is a fruit crop specialist at the University of Florida, who we are privileged to be in relationship with. And he is going to come and talk about some of the challenges of matching tropical and subtropical fruit crops to local environmental conditions. Uh, one thing we all learn is there's no sil silver bullet. Uh, what works uh, depends on uh, context and local conditions. And so he is going to share about the decision making in that regard and particularly low input uh, practices for small holdings. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Jonathan Crane. I want to thank the Rick Burnett and the organizing committee for inviting me here today. I'm going to be, most of my comments, um, there's a lot of information here, so I'm not going to read all these slides. I'm just going to comment about some of the most important aspects of the different fruit crops that I'm going to talk about. Um, and you'll have a chance to look at this later, because I understand they're going to make it available to people. Um, Okay, so really one of the, the most important things that you can do, um, and we see this happen uh, actually throughout the world, is sometimes people will try to grow a particular fruit crop in an environment that it's not adapted to. And then uh, in some cases there's some technology you can use to make the plant productive and be successful. But in a lot of cases, if you place the wrong tree in, the wrong, in, in an environment it's not adapted to, you end up struggling to get the tree to produce and to be sustainably uh, producing. Okay, so uh, you want to try to pick a fruit crop that is, matches the particular specific site that you're going to want to plant it. Um, and so we know that plants that are grown near uh, their edge of adaptability area. They don't grow well usually. They may not set fruit well and, and the yields aren't gonna be very good. So we do know that some of these crops require a cool period um, in order to flower and fruit. Some crops, drought can actually uh, replace the requirement for cool, but there are some crops, as I'll mention, that if they, the drought cannot fully replace or usually does not replace the requirement for cool temperatures. So, you know, in tropical areas, you do have different environments, different micro niches of climate depending on elevation. So that's one way you can try to plant different crops in different elevations and take advantage of those niches, okay? Um, and then, of course, there's other plants that are actually injured or don't do well with cool temperatures. Uh, and I'm talking about temperatures below uh, 15 or 60 degrees, somewhere there. Some plants just don't do well. So again, mat trying to match, it, it's easier to match the crop to the environment because you're not going to change the environment really that much. Okay. So. Temp uh, factors that are important for uh, selecting a site for planting some of these fruit crops are the extremes uh, in temperatures, especially cold temperatures or cool temperatures, but also high temperatures as well. There are some crops, uh, papayas is a good example. If it gets uh, consistently above 95 degrees Fahrenheit, things like that, the uh, flowers revert and they stop, they revert from being either bisexual or female to male, and you're not gonna produce any fruit. So that's a, a, an opposite extreme as opposed to freezing temperatures. Also rainfall extremes and means. So we've, we've seen cases where people will plant uh, mango trees in lowland tropical areas, and they will grow there usually quite well, but the disease pressure on the flowers and the fruit are such that they get very little production. It's just way too wet 
especially if, it, that ha if the wet season occurs during when the trees flower and fruit. So uh, also there's impor what's important is access and availability and the quality of the water. So of course, some of these crops um, have drought tolerance and can do quite well uh, with monsoon type climates. Most of the time though, trees will benefit during specific periods of time to having some uh, access to, to water. Um, and that's usually from the time they flower to the time of harvest. Um, before then and after then, it's not as critical, but during that period, you'll optimize the production of, and the flowering of the crop. Of course, soil type and depth and drainage. Drainage is key. Most fruit crops are, do not tolerate flooded conditions. And those that do tolerate it, they'll survive the flooded conditions, but they're not going to be thriving and producing well. So in some cases, you may have to put trees on mounds, uh, or you may have to punch through a hard pan that may be anywhere from a foot to three feet down to allow the soil to drain during wet periods, things like that. So there are some things you can do um, to manipulate the soil and improve drainage. Also, uh, prevailing winds. Um, that can be important, uh, especially in, in areas that have constant winds. Um, some of these trees actually do far, far better if they're protected from, ex from constant winds. Um, and they'll produce sooner, they'll grow better, they'll recover better from flowering and fruiting. Um, and of course, wind extremes, uh, you know, hurricanes, typhoons, things like that. You can do some things to prepare for those types of events um, before the storm hits, uh, which would increase the likelihood that the tree will remain in place um, during the storm. And then there's also using natural protection. So if there are forests or natural areas or planted windbreaks, those can be used. Um, to help uh, avoid wind or wind protect the crops you're interested in. And I've mentioned already about the topography, which is, uh, you know, elevation, but also the direction of the slopes. Is it fa north facing, south facing, to the east? Those can all have an influence on how well some of these crops do. Okay. So within a farm site, so if we, we talk about rather than looking at a region or a, a large area, but actually looking within a farm site. Um, I mentioned before, temperatures are affected by uh, elevation. And so if you have farms that are in hilly areas, there'll be d these microclimates at the bottom of the, the hill, middle of the hill, and then at the top of the hill. Okay, so you can use those to your advantage um, with respect to looking at temperatures. So. In general, and, it, and again, this is just general, but in lowlands, in the tropical areas, you know, tend to be you know, hot, humid. As you move up the hill, it gets cooler. The temperatures would be less. Up in the top of the hills, or I'm talking about higher elevations, you may actually have more of a subtropical climate than the tropical climate at the bottom of the hill. Also, these directional aspects that I mentioned. So northern versus southern exposures. Um, within the farm site can affect, you know, the hours of temperatures that are warm or cool, uh, directions of the wind, the wind effects. Um, and again, trade winds can, can have a big impact. In some cases, if you have constant trade winds, it can really inhibit uh, the establishment of fruit trees and certainly reduce uh, when they come into production or how well they come into production. Um, Light, light also, uh, nearness to other trees and structures. Excuse me, so, you know, we think of trees getting large and big. Well, eventually, trees, just a, a single individual tree, if the bottom of the canopy of that tree is constantly shaded from the top of the canopy, it will eventually lose that bottom canopy. So your production moves from being close to the ground, to the middle of the tree, to the middle of the tree, to up, high in the tree, so you may not pick your first fruit for seven, eight feet. 
Whereas if you maintain the tree at a lower height, you can maintain that lower canopy. So light is very important how close you are to other trees. So if your larger trees are shading your younger trees, they're not going to grow as well. Many of these fruit crops, um, and you can notice this even on big old trees. So if you have big trees that are next to each other, you'll notice where most of the flowering and fruiting occurs is the parts of the canopy that are exposed to sunlight. So most of these trees, were the actual branches, the ends of the branches or the sides of the branches where they flower and fruit require sunlight in order to produce flowers and fruit regularly. If that's constantly shaded, you'll get much less production on those shaded parts. And then if it's continually shaded, you'll start to lose those parts of the trees. So there's some simple things we're going to talk about that you can do to keep the trees lower. This way you can actually put more trees per unit area, and you can keep the production from the ground up where you're not climbing ladders or trying to get fruit pulling it off of a tree. You can actually pick it from the ground. Um, and this leads to, as I mentioned, the neighboring plants, their size, uh, their spread, and their pest problems. And you'll notice when we go through this, some of these trees are, are quite vigorous and can be huge trees. You know, mangoes, avocados, uh, mame, you know, some of those trees can be very, very big trees. Um, and then there's some that are less vigorous, you know, carambola or star fruit, sugar apple trees. These are smaller trees. So in some cases, you know, planning on where you're going to put the large trees and the smaller trees can be important because they you know, compete for, could compete for sunlight. And some of these bigger trees are harder to keep small than some of the other species of trees. So there's differences in, in how vigorous some of these different species are. But again, pruning, and I don't mean like constantly pruning, but just doing some selective pruning once or twice a year, you can keep these larger trees from, well, keep these trees from getting so large that they become these large, unmanageable trees that then shade out the other trees or the other crops. And I've already mentioned about the soil types. Uh, within, a, within a farm, you could have several different types of soil, you know, from more fertile soil to much less fertile soil. And some of these tree crops actually do better. You, you have more control of their flowering and fruiting and growth in low fertility soils versus being very, very fertile. In contrast, things like bananas, uh, papayas, carambola, they love fertile soil. But things like mangoes, some of these other crops, they'll act, or lychees, they'll actually do better in less fertile soil. Okay, and what I was trying to show here, so you'll notice there's different colored circles, red to red, uh, green to green, purple to purple. And what I was trying to uh, show here is as you increase elevation from left to right, um, decreasing average temperature, right? So the temperatures tend to be cooler at high elevations than they are at the low elevations. And what I was trying to show with the red to red, for instance, the red on the left circle, that's a sugar apple, which is a truly tropical anonaceae fruit crop. But on the right, it has a relative cherimoya, which is truly a subtropical fruit. So you would plant your sugar apple where, it's where it's, the temperatures are constantly warm and hot. You'd put your cherimoya up at the higher elevations. And that's sort of what I'm trying to show here. Same with avocados. There's three races of avocados. And these races and these different hybrids among them are adapted to different climates. So for instance, in South Florida, we grow mostly West Indian type and Guatemalan West Indian type avocados. These are lowland tropical type avocados. Versus on the right, um, you have the Guatemalan, Mexican, and hybrids between Guatemalan and Mexican, that's the green to green type avocados, which are truly subtropical. They don't do well in Florida. They do much better in places like California, Chile, 
or in the tropics at high elevations, like in the Dominican Republic at high elevations. So if you go, as I don't know how many of you have been to the Dominican Republic, but if you go there, they're growing the tropical avocados in the lowlands, and then you go up at high elevations, you know, 1,000 meters, they're growing the subtropical avocados up there. And that's what I mean. So you, you have these choices with the, even within species. On the bottom left is um, passion fruit in the purple circle, and that's yellow passion fruit. That's the tropical, pa one of the tropical passion fruits. On the right, you have the purple, the true purple, which is actually a subtropical passion fruit. And if you see that being grown, it's being grown at the higher elevations. The yellow is being grown at the lower elevations. So you see sort of the theme that I'm getting at. Even within these different fruit crops, there are different subspecies or relatives that are adapted to different climates. Okay, so <clears throat> again, the directional aspects, uh, which way the slopes are facing, um, can influence, as I mentioned, the maximum and the minim minimum and average temperatures, the duration of these temperatures, the flow of air. So if there are very, very cold temperatures, um, moving down the hill um, or down the slope, light intensity, so which is it facing north or south or southwest or southeast can influence the hours of light, can shading. Winds are also affected, whether it's on the uh, leeward or the windward side, um, and how long the winds uh, are, uh, uh, have an effect. And then, of course, nearness to large bodies of water. So I think everybody here knows the closer you are to large bodies of water, lakes, big rivers, uh, oceans, the warmer it tends to be, and also the less in extreme highs and extreme low temperatures. So in some cases, that becomes very important. It is very important in Florida. The closer you are to the coast, the more options you have and what you can grow. The farther you are inland, in Florida, we actually we get freezing temperatures, and so that limits, in some cases, what you can grow, or at least grow without using a lot of uh, technology and, and uh, infrastructure. So here's some of the wind, wind effects, as I mentioned. Um, and so you'll see an example here. Um, let me see, does this have a... Yeah, sorry. So if you look at the examples on the far left, you'll see the, this is actually banana leaves. Um, and excessive wind to banana leaves, a little bit of the wind breaking up the leaves is okay, it actually improves its, its uh, growth and production. But if it gets too tattered, it actually causes problems for the plant for growth, development, and of course then that affects the fruit production as an example. So these are mechanical. In the center is carambola leaves, it's a little hard to see, but what happens is the leaves are actually hitting each other and hitting the stems due to the wind and it's damaging, physically damaging the leaves. And here's carambola where the fruit is actually damaged because the fruit is knocking into the stems. Um, so what can happen, negative effects of, of winds, that it can prohibit or prolong the time for the tree to establish. So if I plant a carambola tree, um, wind protected site versus one that's not wind protected. The tree that's wind protected comes into production sometimes within 12 to 24 months, starts producing fruit. The tree that was planted out in the windy site may not start production for three or four years, and even then it's, it's gonna be struggling. So it's, it's a day and night difference. So it, winds can be very important with, with some crops. Um, whoops, let me go back, is that possible? Yeah. Um, yeah, and also wind can also affect the fruit set during flowering and production. So if you have dry, desiccating winds during flowering for some of these crops, you're actually drying out the, the stigmatic surfaces on the female parts of the flowers, and you get less fruit set and less fruit production. Um, another thing, too, is also winds, and, and you'll hear uh, many farmers cringe during uh, their season when the fruit is on the tree, 
you get wind, windy conditions, and it knocks the fruit off the tree. Because all these trees have a natural fruit drop. So most of them, you know, they'll set fruit. Uh, they may set, let's say, you know, 500 fruit on the tree. By the time you harvest, usually there's only, let's say, 125, 200 fruit on the tree. And that's just from natural drop, the natural physiology. But if you add wind to it, you can knock off, you know, all or most of the fruit. So wind breaks, they can improve uh, the, the growth of young trees and young, you know, plantings of trees. Um, and as I already mentioned, can decrease the time to flowering and fruiting. Um, and as I mentioned before, they can potentially help uh, with increase in fruit set and production because you don't have the damage to the, the flowers. Um, and also reduce mechanical damage to the, the fruit crop itself. And, um, well, and there's both man-made and, and natural windbreaks. Okay, light exposure. So what's important is uh, the hours of shade, as I mentioned at the beginning. So the more hours of shade, um, if it goes too long, you're going to end up losing those lower branches. So you lose the lower canopy. Um, and so rather than having, uh, whoops. Rather than having production from the ground, from the ground up, you end up losing all this lower production because it can't survive in the shade. So your production is all up here, which is difficult to harvest and take care of, versus from the ground up. So here's some situations where you have these large trees, very very close to these young trees, and you can see the growth on this side of the tree. Well, it's a little hard to see, probably. Um, on the bottom left uh, picture is, is not growing well, not producing well. It's losing that canopy. It's not developing that canopy because of it's next to this very large other tree. So in this case, you'd want to pull this other tree way, way back to give this other tree a chance to fill in its canopy and develop. Um, also, besides losing the canopy, sometimes by having too much shade increases the amount of insect and disease problems you have. And that's because with more shade, there's more hours of wet surfaces on the trees if it rains. Um, and also, a lot of the insects like to infest on shady parts versus sun-exposed parts of the tree. Okay, so neighboring plants, and I'm, I know I keep harping on this, but it, it really, uh, is important. So the neighboring plants considerations, as I mentioned, is light competition among the adjacent trees, water and nutrient competition among adjacent trees. They can, com if they're too close together, they can compete for water and nutrients as well. In some cases, you can actually use that to your advantage to sort of limit the tree's size, but again, you really have to control the height of the tree to control the shading. Um, so, okay, so some of the positive uh, effects um, of, of neighboring plants uh, is diversity of the crops, uh, the sustainability, in some cases reduced pest problems because you have a diversity of different species and it's not a monoculture and therefore sometimes less insect and disease problems. Um, also, but you do need to keep in mind in some cases uh, one crop can actually be an alternative host for insects or diseases for a particular other crop. So as an example, um, cucurbits can harbor uh, a water mosaic virus that's similar to a virus that attacks papaya. And so having your papaya planting near where you're growing squash may not be a good idea because you can get the viruses going back and forth. Um, however, in general, the plant diversity definitely decreases insect and disease problems. Okay, so most soil types are okay. Um, and I mentioned before, crops that benefit from highly fertile soils 
can be things like avocados, papayas, bananas, carambolas, guavas, and passion fruit. They are all about having sufficient nutrients uh, and that really keep them productive. Um, but crops that benefit from much less fertility, mangoes, lychees, and longans. Soil drainage, and I already mentioned this too, soil drainage really is very important. A um, lot of these plants do not thrive or produce well if the soil is continually saturated or wet or flooded. And so if you're in a situation or an area of the farm that has some drainage problems, you want to be sure to either not plant there or to provide bedding or some kind of drainage ditches or something to allow that water to move off. So this is just showing, and, and you guys can look at this later, but this is just showing a table of flood tolerance of different fruit crops. And as I mentioned, even though uh, some of these crops are considered tolerant to wet conditions, they're not going to grow and produce well. It just means they survive it. Whereas crops like uh, sugar apples and atamoyas and avocados, especially avocados and papaya, usually you're looking at a, a limit of maybe 48 hours of flooding and then the, they'll die. So they're quite sensitive. And it has to do with an interaction between the roots, low oxygen conditions because of the flooding or saturation, but also diseases in the soil that destroy the root system. Okay, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about, so agroforestry or small holder operations, um, and uh, perhaps some agroforestry that would relate to some agroforestry uh, ideas. So in a multi-cropped farm, um, if you're able to identify some small areas to plant two or three or more trees of specific tropical fruit crops, potentially for you know, consumption, but also uh, for sale if, if that's appropriate. Um, and it can consist of more than one species. Um, you wanna place it in the farm. Where you place it is critical because what I just talked about, the soils, drainage, but also light and wind exposure and temperatures. So just taking into account the, the information from the previous slides. And I just say again, managing the size of these trees will be of great benefit in keeping them productive uh, and fruiting and flowering. So as an example, three mango or avocado trees along a full sunlit perimeter of a property and three carambola trees in moderately sunny areas protected by the wind, from the wind by the larger trees, right? Uh, or 10 papaya plants in full or near full sunlight area nearby. So you're using those large trees, and carambola is somewhat shade tolerant. So you, you, you have these large trees, and they're, protecting wind, they're giving wind protection and a little bit of shade, which is a benefit for the carambola, which is adapted to windless conditions and uh, sunlight, some shade. So I just mentioned here, I just have a list, crops that benefit from fertile soils and those uh, that benefit from limited nutrient soils. So in some cases, you want to be sure you're, you're not uh, putting opposing crops next to each other. So for instance, putting guava trees next to mango or lychee trees may not be a good idea because the guava trees uh, want a lot of nutrients and a lot of water. The lychee or the mango doesn't need it, doesn't want it, it doesn't benefit from having access to water and nutrients all the time, whereas things like papaya and guava do. So I'll just make some comments on the different, uh, some of the different crops. So the key point with avocado, two, couple of maybe three points, needs well-drained soil, and I've, I've mentioned that. Second is, in some cases, and maybe you've seen examples of this, avocado trees that are isolated trees that don't produce much fruit. 
Some avocados are self-fertile. They can self-pollinate and produce fruit. But many avocado varieties uh, need cross-pollination. And so that might be why, if you see isolated trees, they're not producing. They need to have another type of avocado tree nearby. Hopefully, there, and I won't go into the details, there's two types of avocado trees, A and B type trees. And you want to have an A near a B, and you want to be sure they're an A and B that flower at the same time. So I know it's a little complicated, but that's, that might be why if you see trees uh, that aren't producing. And the nice thing about avocados, there, there is a range of cold tolerance, as I already mentioned, from trees that are adapted to tropical to trees that are cool subtropical. There's also the nice thing about avocados, there's a potential to have fruit almost all year round or year, all year round. By changing varieties or changing elevations, you can stagger the production throughout the year. So Florida now has about a 10 to 12 month harvest season, and it's because we grow different varieties. So we harvest different varieties at different times of the year. In contrast, California harvests basically one variety, and they do that by moving up and down the state, from the southern part of the state to the middle of the state, or they move from the bottom of the hill to the top of the hill, which changes when that particular variety is harvested. Again, these trees can be easily pruned by uh, just a few pruning cuts once or twice a year. Keep the tree at 10 to 15 feet high or three, three to four meters high. And you'll still keep productive on the sides of the trees and you'll keep that productive canopy on the sides of the tree. And this is just to show you some of the diversity of avocados. These are, the, these are some West Indian early season types. Um, and then this is a late season. This would be Haas. This is the main one grown in many places, including California. But uh, adapted to tropical, tropical, and tropical conditions, cool subtropical conditions. And again, many different varieties out there uh, to choose from. And so this is adapted, has a wider adaptation to tropical and subtropical conditions. And so there's a lot of, a lot of uh, choice. Okay, Barbados cherry. So I put in here on, on most of these where I talk a little bit about their cold tolerance in case that's important. Again, well drained. This is a shrub, very high in vitamin C. There are a number of varieties. It can be kept as a small plant, as a bushy plant. Carambola, or star fruit. And so the main points for this, um, well, you're going to want well-drained soil, and I've mentioned this before, highly sensitive to wind. So you want to plant it in a site that is protected from wind. And as I mentioned, moderately shade tolerant. So that's a good thing if it's next to other trees or, or structures. Does benefit from a lot of organic matter and mulch. Um, and if there is water available during flowering to fruiting, it will benefit from that as well. These trees can be easily kept 6 to 12 feet. Very, very easy. And there's some other techniques with bending the limbs and things like that. You can keep the tree small quite easily. And there's many different varieties, uh, sweet varieties. Historically, there were a lot of uh, seedlings that were sour. These are all sweet varieties. And very productive trees. You can have a 10-foot tree, 250 pounds of fruit a year. So they can be very, very productive. In tropical areas, you're talking uh, anywhere from four or five up to seven crops in one year. Here in Florida, we get two. But in tropical, truly tropical areas, you're talking like almost constant production. Bananas, and I think most of you are very familiar with these. I'm, I'm going to be talking just about some specific uh, bananas and some ideas with that. There's numerous clones. Um, they do best, whoops, they do best in, um, well, I'm going to go back. 
in full sunlight, in well-drained soils, and wind protection. Actually, they will benefit from wind protection. Okay, there are, are quite a few new cultivars. Um, some of the issues we've seen with some of these new cultivars is they don't taste like the traditional banana that people are used to in their sp specific local area. And so the, even though these are more productive, they've got good disease resistance to Panama disease, which is a major disease of, of bananas, uh, and to black cigatoka, uh, and to nematodes, they don't taste like the banana that everybody's used to in a particular area. So there, there's some resistance to it, but um, these are resistant to the major diseases and issues. So Goldfinger, Mona Lisa, this is a FIA uh, series developed in Honduras, one called Sweetheart. Many others, uh, Saba, Kofi, Clunamwa. Okay, Jabba de Kaba. This is a small tree. Um, you can plant it close, you know, 10, 15, or less, 12 feet from other trees or buildings or structures. Can have four to six crops per year. Is generally slow growing. It does like acid soils. Um, and will benefit, you know, from mulching uh, as well. And it flowers on the stems, on the trunks, and then produces something that looks like a grape on the trunks as well. And so you can get, uh, very well known in Brazil, um, you can get, as I said, a number of crops off the same tree in one year. Okay, mangoes, and I'm sure you're all familiar with those. Um, as I mentioned, it does very well, uh, especially in dry climates, once it gets established. So you might have young trees that you would need to water periodically to get them established. Once the, once the trees get to be, you know, five, six plus years old, especially older mature trees, they don't need to be watered very often. Here in Florida, generally not at all once they get established. But we have, you know, 1,600 millimeters of rainfall, so they're getting, you know, rainfall throughout most of the year. Um, but in areas where there is drought, once they get established, they don't need as much water. They are very sensitive to saline water or salt-contaminated uh, salt soils. Um, there are hundreds of cultivars. Again, this tree can be kept small. And, and one thing I would tell you, when you look at avocado, when you're choosing, avocado, mango cultivars, you want to look at the growth habit. Hopefully they'll be rated as vigorous or moderately vigorous or non-vigorous. So when you, you look at the different cultivars, if it's very vigorous, this means it's gonna get, it can grow very, very quickly, it gets to be a big tree, harder to keep small. If it's a low vigor variety, easy to keep the tree small. So you can use, you know, depending on where you're gonna place it, put the larger ones, the more vigorous ones in a separate place from where the less vigorous ones are. You can plant more of the less vigorous ones together near each other at a closer spacing than putting these big vigorous trees close together because they, they'll compete with each other. So these are some old time favorites uh, in Florida, but there are numerous other varieties and shapes and sizes uh, and textures and flavors um, to choose from. And local ones, uh, every region has local ones. Okay, Longan. Um, this, uh, Longan and lychee are similar in, in the sense that uh, they require a period of dormancy when the tree is not actively growing. Longan is a little different than lychee in that, um, in general, you don't need quite as long a period of cool temperatures. And what do I mean by cool temperatures? I mean temperatures above freezing, but below 
uh, about about 15, 14, 15 degrees, maybe 16 degrees, um, in order to flower and fruit regularly. So these trees will grow all over the place, but they don't fruit and flower except in areas where they get the sufficient requirement in order for their buds and the ends of the shoots to switch from being vegetative buds to flower buds. Um, the other thing I would say about it is, uh, oh well, once these trees are established, they're, they're, they're easy, pretty easy to take care of. Um, they're low nutrient input. Again, you need you try to keep them small. That's long gan there. That's a variety called Kohala. Loquat, this is a cool subtropical species, um, very cold tolerant. Um, there's numerous cultivars to choose from, although they're not readily available always. Again, this tree can be kept rather small. Of course, there are some fruit fly problems with this. Um, People can bag the fruit um, to protect it, although that's labor intensive. And here's some of the varieties that are in Florida. Lychees, this is a relative of the longan, and this is the one that does require, uh, also requires a, a cool period in order to flower and fruit well. Low nutrient, you don't want to apply a lot of nutrients. There's numerous cultivars. And again, uh, keeping the tree smaller, you'll be able to put more trees in a unit area and uh, keep the production at lower in the canopy. Yeah. Well, I'm not so sure about the rusty nails. Uh, yeah, I'll take a question in a few minutes. Sure. So numerous varieties of lychee, and there's a lot of mislabeling of the varieties, but uh, papaya, okay. This one is a truly tropical tree. Numerous cultivars, fast growing. You plant it today in four, well, plant a, a five or six inch seedling. Uh, in four months, it's gonna flower, and you'll make your first harvest in nine or 10 months. So very quick growing. Um, loves high fertility, mulching, and irrigation. Um, the one of the complicating factors with it is there are three types of plants. There are male plants, female plants, and bisexual plants. So if you're growing a variety that has male and female plants, you need at least one male for about every 10 female plants in order to get cross-pollination. If you're growing a bisexual type, you only need one plant because it's self-fertile. Um, let me see if this, okay. So this is just showing you some plants, but one of the things I was gonna mention is, so sometimes papaya, so as you know, the fruit column moves up as it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Well, pretty soon it gets above, even I can reach about eight feet, gets above eight feet. Now you've got a problem with harvesting it. You've gotta climb up on the tree or climb some way to get the fruit. One thing you can do is what we would call a rattoon the crop. You can cut the tree at about four feet and it will send out new shoots and go ahead and select three or four of those shoots, remove the others, let those develop and they will begin to flower and fruit at a lower height. And so that gives you more time to produce fruit at a low height and keeps the production going. Passion fruit, so as I mentioned, there's tropical passion fruits and subtropical passion fruits. They need well-drained soil, that's something they all will need. Um, they do get some collar rots and root rots, so you wanna keep the mulch away from the trunks. Some of them, uh, the purple generally is self-compatible, so the flowers will set fruit from their own pollen, okay? The yellows, generally you need another variety of yellow or a purple nearby to cross-pollinate to set fruit. Nice thing about uh, passion fruit um, is you can hand-pollinate them. There are native insects, in, in carpenter bees, other large flying insects that will pollinate them. 
although those insects may not be present in your particular area. Honeybees are also useful, although sometimes they're not, they're, depending on the variety and everything, they're uh, not good pollinators because they're too small. So they don't contact the, uh, the uh, flower, the female flower parts. They go in and they steal the nectar. They don't happen to bump into the pollen, into the anthers, and then they, they leave and they haven't pollinated. So you can hand pollinate and it's very easy. Um, two methods. One is, you know, you take a little water coloring paintbrush, you cover it in pollen from the anthers, and then you touch the female parts. An easier method is to take cotton gloves or your hands, and you contaminate your hand, not contaminate, you touch the male flower parts and get them covered with pollen, and then you walk up to the female part, female, uh, other flowers, and touch the female parts with your hands. So you're just going like this and it's much more rapid. Anyway, there's many hybrids uh, between the purple and the yellow, and these are some of the hybrids. This one sort of looks purple, it's actually a hybrid. This one is red, so there's a lot of hybrids out there as well. Pineapples, uh, numerous cultivars um, can take, you know, they, they have, the, let me put it this way, the larger the plant, the bigger the fruit. So when it, if you want large fruit, you need to let the plant get large before it flowers. In some places, the problem is cool weather intervenes when the plant is small and it induces it to flower before it's really a bigger plant. So in some places, you, you, if, it's, if, you, if it does experience cold temperatures um, in the winter, it may, not, it may flower too early and you end up with a small fruit. So you might want to locate these where it's not going to experience these cool temperatures. And then if you have a plant with three foot leaves, it's going to produce a large pineapple. Pattaya or dragon fruit. Um, this has become quite popular in many places in the world now. Um, you, they're generally grown on trellises or actually on other trees. In some cases, trees that have been cut down like a hat rack of a tree, looks like a, a, a hat rack. Um, they do have some pollination issues, so you have to be careful. If, you're, if you've got vines that are flowering and they're not setting fruit, either you're going to have to hand pollinate them or you're gonna have to grow another variety that may be compatible or uh, you may be doing something that which inhibits the natural pollinators, which are different moths and bat species. Um, the thing about these, they flower generally at night. So if you are gonna hand pollinate them, you're gonna be out hand pollinating them in the night. Okay. And there's many varieties and colors. Sapodilla is another, uh, this plant uh, can be a large plant, but can be kept productive and small. number of different varieties. Spondias, uh, Amborella, or Golden Apple, or Red Mombins, or Yellow Mombins. This is another one that a plant can be kept small. Fruit flies can be a problem with the fruit in some areas. Sugar Apples, this is a, a truly tropical uh, anone. Easy to keep small. This one is not pollinated by bees. It's pollinated by beetles, by sap beetles. And there's different ones. Tamarind, large tree, produces uh, these pods. Does anybody have any questions? Uh, about nails. Yeah, I yeah, pounding nails to get the iron requirement for trees. Um, I can't say that I've tried it, but thinking about the form of iron that plants take up and use, I, I'm not so sure that would uh, really work. Yeah. Any thoughts on some jackfruit? Yeah, jackfruit is another one that could be grown. Excellent fruit crop. 
produces very large fruits, can be very productive. Trees, uh, jackfruit trees can be kept small as well because you know they, they flower and they fruit on the large limbs and the trunks. So there's no need to have a 30-foot tree, uh, especially trying to harvest a 30-pound fruit from a 30-foot tree can be difficult, yeah. But that's, that's another one that is a good choice, yes. Last question, Tom. <laughs> yeah, you're referring, yeah, w we had a project uh, to develop papaya ring spot virus papayas. We, they are actually genetically modified, which I know some people have an issue with genetically modified plants, but they are resistant. What we're doing now is we are propagating four or five of the clones for a large planting. Uh, in an effort to see how much interest there is in the industry and also to have enough plants that if somebody is interested, we can say, here, we can give you 100 plants to try. So it's not commercially available yet and probably won't be for about three years because we have to go through this stepped process to release it. And when we do release those, those particular clones that we're gonna release will be offered primarily as tissue cultured plants, not as seeds. So you'd have to buy a tissue cultured plant. Please join me in appreciation, appreciating Jonathan Crane.